Welcome to the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. He's got a new dance, it's a bit like this. He's got a new dance, it's Chris Pritchard. Welcome to Tuesday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. I've got some chocolate in my mouth. Life at the minute is really tough, I'll be honest. I'm uh, I'm struggling to walk into the kitchen and not come out with something either in my mouth or in my hands getting ready to eat. I don't know what it is, and yeah, I know. Y'all out there that are super motivated and you're fit and you're healthy and you're, you're real athletes, you're looking at me going, just put it down, it's simple, just don't eat it. But it's not. Us on the other side of the fence know that sometimes you just can't help it. And sometimes it just gives you that hit that you need that makes you feel better for a couple of seconds. And yes, it makes you feel co- good for a couple of seconds, but then you go back to feeling a bit... That's where I'm at, I'll be honest. Um, that's pretty hard news. Let's have a transition. Actually, and on that subject, let me tell you a little story um, of something that happened to me. 2015, something like that. Finished cycling, retired from si- retired from cycling. Never really started, so you can't really retire from something you never you never start, especially something you're not professional in, or at least not getting paid them Benjamin. Anyway, got this new job as a presenter, fitness presenter, no less. I'll not name the channel, but it was a channel on YouTube, and I was a fitness presenter presenting a wealth of knowledge of training as I am a personal trainer by trade as well as my cycling knowledge and, and other things right so there I was performing this hit workout high intensity training workout going through the motions really hitting it hard you know keep your abs nice and tight guys really focus on that effort come on push the envelope throwing out as many cliches as I could engage those glutes do all this blah 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 right producer of the the video says excuse me Chris can we just stop one minute I'm saying yeah what's up she says uh, can you just you just, you just bring your belly in, just just pull your belly in a little bit. You look a bit fat on the screen. I said, what? I said, yeah, just try and try and flatten that belly out. I said, yeah, I can. No bad. I said, hey, Commonwealth athlete here. What? Oh, sorry, you've done a sportive. My apologies. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm digressing once again. <laughs> let's get on with the news. And first up, let's talk about some racing news. Yesterday was, was pretty much dominated by the racing world. So we'll just touch on a couple of stories on the racing world and then we'll move on to other things happening within within the the environment of cycling okay good and first up israel cycling academy are poised to buy out katusha to secure place in the 2020 world tour now i spoke about this a few weeks ago potentially a few months ago the alpacine and canyon were both pulling out of their sponsorship deals with katusha they were moving money elsewhere i think canyon really want to get behind machu van der Poel, so they're putting a lot of money behind him and obviously movie star and then alpacine well i'll be honest that makes your scalp very, very dry indeed. So I wouldn't advise buying that, especially if you've got skin sensitivity, okay? I've got some upstairs if you want to buy it off me. It's, it's probably half full now, but I won't be using it. Bloody marketing. Anyway, there was also other people trying to get hold of this World Tour license. There was talks of Bjarne Reese potentially getting involved in this deal. The oligarch that's been bankrolling Katusha for God knows how long. Igor Makarov, he could potentially just carry on bankrolling the team and it stays as it is, but we've got 11 riders in Katusha who are still under contract like I said until the end of 2020 so what this means is that if this happens Israeli cycling are going to bring their 11 riders we're going to get those Katusha riders who are already under contract and then we get one big old team the team is still going to run under the name of Israel Cycling Academy and this means that potentially Dan Martin won't lose his status as a world tour rider as he signed a two-year deal with the Israeli cycling team as well as Ben Herman signing his contract only a couple of days ago to stay with the Israeli cycling team again for another two years. So as soon as this deal happens, we'll probably be the second or third people to to let you know about it. I mean, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to give you any spoilers here on the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. I know how you don't like being told about stuff first here for some reason. All right. But when it happens, we'll try and let you know ASAP. And next up, and a couple of days prior to La Vuelta, Kenny Ellison, who was supposed to be riding for Team Ineos, was dropped at the last minute for David De La Cruz. He came in and, well, Team Ineos, let's pretend, apart from Teo Gagan Hart, let's pretend that... And oh, I know, for getting through his, his, his first ever Grand Tour, let's pretend that, that, that... Well, were they even there? I don't know. I didn't see any other riders apart from them two. But anyway, Kelly Ellison has signed for Trek Segafredo moving into 2020, which kind of shines a light on exactly why they potentially might have dropped him for Love Welter. Listen, I know I said two stories about racing news, but we've got to check this video out. So this is Simon Pillou. He's a pro rider for I Am Excelsior. And this was coming into the finish of the Tour de 
the doobs, doobs, doobs. In real time, it's difficult to actually see what happened. It looked like his handlebars just, just fell from the stem and, uh, well, he, he had no control over the bike. But let's watch it again in slow motion and try and dissect exactly what happened with this crash because uh, it's pretty serious. In slow motion, you can actually see his handlebars almost working independently to, to the bike itself. And, and at that moment, you must know that there's something wrong, but there's probably not a great deal you can do about it. You've committed to your sprint, you've committed to your effort, you may as well see it through to the end now, and that's exactly what Simon did, or at least tried to do. So he's coming in here, and as you can see, those, those bars just aren't acting the way they should. And you can see in that shot there, he's all of a sudden started veering to the left, and that's probably because he started to apply pressure through that left hand onto that handlebar to try and get some leverage out for that sprint or that effort. And because he's got nothing to lean against, he's just pushed his body weight out to the left, and as he's done that, that's taken that bike out to the left-hand side and obviously straight into the AG2R rider. So if you just pause it there, you can see the bars now completely independent from that bike. He's not going to be able to control that bike with those bars. And it looks like the, the fork and then the stem that goes up into the frame, it looks like it's been cut off flush there at the top of the frame, which means, or at least it indicates to me, that half of that, or at least a little part of that, is now wedged in your stem, and that's where it snapped. It snapped at this part here where the stem connects to that fork steerer. Does that make sense? And if that's the case, then I can only think of a few possibilities as to what's happened here. Firstly, a potentially a carbon defect within the fork steerer. Secondly, um, there's been damage to it, which hasn't been picked up on by the mechanics and then they've just carried on riding the bike and it's just got weaker and weaker and weaker over time. So, you know, maybe a, a crash prior in the season that's gone undetected with any more damage and, and then that's eventually, it's just grown weaker and weaker and to the point where it's snapped. Or lastly, someone's over tightened those stem bolts. Now, if that's the case, someone's in trouble there because they're, they're limited to, I think it's six or five or six newton meters. Um, so there's quite a low tolerance on those bolts when you're, especially when you're attaching them to carbon, so I don't know what's caused this. This has happened to me before, and it was all my own fault, and I'm an idiot for doing it, but I didn't know any better. So I didn't realize that there was a, there was a torque tolerance on a, on a steering stem. I just didn't. I thought you'd just tighten it up until it was nice and tight, and then you went on your way. And I've done that on my bike. This was back in 20, wow, 2010, 2010, 2011. So there I was riding my bike, do do do, going through the motions, right? Got to a set of traffic lights. It was on a slight incline as well. And there I was, I think I've told this story before. There I was, track standing because it's much easier than clipping in and out. I was in the big ring and I looked down and I thought, oh, it's going to take a bit of effort to, to get up this hill in the big ring. Loads of kids crossing the road because college had just finished where, uh, where I was. Checking me out while I was track standing. Oh, look at that guy, you can... You can Stand still on his bike without putting his feet down. Ladies, you what, 17, doesn't matter. So there I am, head down. Lights go green, I straighten my bars, I put some pressure through the handlebars to set off, and as I do, I literally rip the handlebars out of the fork stem, and I go down, like a ton of bricks. Thankfully it wasn't in a sprint, and I was stationary, but still, Doing it in front of a bunch of kids is one of the most embarrassing things of my life. But there I was, holding my handlebars, and the uh, the fork steerer was, was wedged in the stem, and it had clean snapped off. Anyway, sorry, it's not about me. It's about Simon Perry who crashed in this bike, um, and why he crashed, or how he crashed. It's still a mystery. Leave them down below. Let me know what you think to this crash. All right, next up, and a bit of a serious subject here, a cyclist has died after sustaining injuries whilst trying to escape dive bombing magpies. Now, I didn't know this was a thing until I saw one of Shane Miller's videos, I think it was last year, and, and he recapped on it a couple of weeks ago, that over in Australia, magpies are bloody aggressive and they will attack cyclists. The 76-year-old rider fell while trying to get away from the swooping bird. It appears that after leaving the path, he hit a park fence near Sydney, and the cyclist suffered serious head injuries, was treated by paramedics, but later died in hospital. It's not something you'd ever expect to happen to you. Like you just go out riding. It's obviously a, a massive issue 
down in Australia, these aggressive magpies, and they're way more aggressive than, than what we get here, these are just annoying here. But by the sounds of it, during mating season, down in Australia, they want to attack humans, especially humans on bikes. And, and what an unlucky set of circumstances to happen for this man to lose his life over a knobhead of a magpie. It's just, it's, it's pretty sad. No, it's not pretty sad, it's really bloody sad. On behalf of all the cycling community, and I know this man's family won't be watching this this new show, but again, I feel like I should pass my condolences on to him and his family. It's what a horrible thing. But I tell you one thing, over here in the UK, we might not have to worry about magpies, but we do have to worry about knobheads on mopeds. So this only came to my attention yesterday when Cycling Weekly posted this story, but this tweet was posted back in August. So this tweet from Ray Phil um, at Motorcycle Theft is, is more about scooter theft and bike theft within the, the, the capital. But check this out, like, I mean, I don't want to show you these images because I don't know how any of these cyclists are. So if any have sustained serious injuries, then we shouldn't be showing it, but light needs to be brought on this. Because what a bunch of absolute f***ing these kids are. So in Ray's tweet, absolutely shocking, anarchy springs to mind when watching such a hopeless video. There is not much to say really, but it's terrifying from beginning to end. These are the youths of today who are inspiring a new generation. And these kids are just going around being absolute menaces to society. What a bunch of f***s. That's the only thing I can think to say because they are a bunch of quits. I don't get it. What is the purpose of this? So basically they're filming themselves, kicking cyclists off their bikes, pushing cyclists off their bikes, laughing about it, then posting it, I presume to their social media. So it can't be that difficult to actually find out who these people are and bring them to justice. But what is the point? What are you gaining out of this? When you weigh it up, when you when you write down the pros and cons of your actions here, what are your, what pros? We'll come back to pros, cons. Right, we could kill someone. I mean, we probably won't go to jail, so we could put that as a pro, won't go to jail, regardless of what we do, unless we kill someone. Cons. Um, potentially could kill someone, uh, potentially could cause serious injury to someone, uh, potentially upset God knows how many people's lives when their family and relatives and friends all find out that they got killed because we pushed them over on their bicycle. Well, I'm reading this here and yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think we should go out and we should execute this plan because yeah, that'll be, oh, Sharon might enjoy this content. It'll give Dave a laugh. Put that in pros. Yeah, it's definitely worth doing. Let's go out and do it. F me. I mean, seriously. What is this f world coming to when this is happening? This should not happen. It just shouldn't happen. There's no excuses for it. And listen, I'm not getting political. I'm not getting political on this one, one bit. Maybe a tiny bit. But I don't want this to be about politics. However, with what's happening here in the UK at the minute, it seems that everybody's focus is on that thing when their focus should be right here on what's happening right now with kids doing this. Like, it almost feels like the youth of today can get away with literally anything because there is no consequence to their actions, unless they kill somebody. And even then, I dare say they'll get away with it lightly. Like, I'm talking lightly. 10 years in jail would be lightly for killing someone by pushing them off the goddamn bike but they feel like they can get away with it. So they're doing it. When really, we shouldn't be wasting money and time on this thing over here. Remember that, that thing? Begins with B. And we should have plowed all that money into our public services. More coppers on the streets. And giving our coppers free reign to literally do whatever they need to to stop these people doing it. They should be bind into a legal contract as soon as they break the law. They've metaphorically signed that piece of paper that says, I understand by partaking in this activity, I'm waiving my human rights, and if the coppers kill me, so be it. 
shouldn't have been a knobhead in the first place. A couple of months ago, potentially last year, coppers were given the right to be able to just ram mopeds and scooters off the road if they were causing a nuisance, if they were causing, not a nuisance, if they were breaking the law. As if it's not scary enough already riding your bike on the roads, then you've got to contend with like this, doing like that. Just don't do it. Just, I know none of them will watch this video, but just take a moment and say, is it worth it? Because it's not. Now, let me open the floor to you guys. Let me know down in the comments. What do you think to people like this? And let's finish off on this feel good story. I don't know if it's a feel good story or I don't know what, but hopefully it's going to have a very happy ending. The story starts over on Twitter with this tweet from Brian Smith. Lovely to meet Tatia Martin, 99 today in Madrid. Finished six in the women's race. Great talented 20 year old. Fist bump emoji. And Maria Martins replied to that tweet saying, thanks for this moment, okay emoji, smiley face emoji. Nothing more than a nice little interaction between two fellow cyclists. It's not until Ola Chenoa tweets this out that we get an idea of what this story is all about. This woman is awesome. Finishes sixth in La Madrid Challenge, then goes around handing out a printed CV to the teams to try and get a contract for next year. So of course I spoke to her for an upcoming cycling podcast, Feminine. And then the winner of that event, Chloe Hoskins, then tweeted, I've been following Tedda Martin's 99 results this year. She is an exciting sprinting talent coming from a country not yet represented on the really big stage in the women's peloton. Portugal flag emoji. Love the grittiness and determination this shows. Hope a team finds a spot for her. So Maria Martins, a medalist in the European Championships, sixth in La Madrid Challenge. Like this, this girl at 20 years old deserves a shot at the big time. Surely she has proven herself. And how humbling that this woman, after doing that in that event, she could have sat there and just gone on Instagram and just gone, hey, I'm sixth in the world, check me out, blah, blah, blah. But she didn't. She was like, I need a job for next year. I'm a grinder. I'm a hustler. Please take my CV. Please take my CV. And hopefully, fingers crossed, she will get a professional contract because clearly she's someone who is talented enough to be able to do that. If she can keep with this crowd, if she can be there, at the end of a race like that, when you've got the likes of Chloe Hoskins in there, Lisa Brenauer in there, Lucinda Brand in there, which has just reminded me of a comment we're gonna cover in a second. This woman, she should be up there. There's not a great deal we can, or is there? Now, is there something we can do to try and get this woman's name out there to get her a contract for next year? If you can think of anything, leave it down below, but this woman deserves a shot at the big time. Now, we've not done comments for a long time, but this comment certainly deserves a mention. This was sent to me via a DM on Instagram. If you want to follow me on Instagram, please go down below and follow the, the, the Instagram. Uh, my personal Instagram account's there. Feel free to send me messages, random messages. I appreciate the majority of them. This message from Hoagie Wheels, um, aka Kian Hogan. And Kian sent me this message yesterday. Hey Pritch, I see you mentioned Lucinda Brand in today's CPCN. She's getting married in three weeks to my cousin, Paul Ambassador. I was like, oh sweet, that sounds nice. She's going double barrel with her name though. Lucinda, brand ambassador. Sorry. So, so sorry, I'll let myself out. Yeah, let yourself out. And don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out. That's it for today. Thanks for watching everybody. Now over the next couple of days, I'm away doing a very exciting photo shoot. I'll try and take you along with me and provide as much content as I can. But if we don't get the news for a couple of days, just don't worry, we'll be back live on Friday with a stream. We can all catch up then. But until then, make sure you've hit that like button. Make sure you've hit that subscribe button. Make sure you've hit that notification bell so you know when our videos drop. Other than that, all that's left to say is see you soon-ish.